Now it's time for the last word with Ali Belshi in for Lawrence. Good evening, Ali. Uh, I, I appreciate everything. For, it was a fantastic show, highly distracting for me trying to prepare for this show. But uh, the points you just made about Alexei Navalny and Russia would be important just in another country. But to imagine that in a country that does not enjoy democracy, these protesters came out or whatever, funeral attendees, if you want to call them, came out and risked their safety and security to protest for democracy is a remarkable lesson for us here in America yeah, about what's it, going on. It is a really, we felt it was a really important note to yes. end the week on, because I know it's been a tough week for people, and it sometimes yes. feels like the system isn't working, but it's really important to keep that, that struggle in mind. Thank you for doing that. We're going to pick up exactly where you left off. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Have a week. good show. Russia without Putin. That was also one of the chants shouted by the thousands of people who turned out today for the funeral of the opposition leader and the Putin nemesis, Alexei Navalny. Thousands of people who knew that they were risking their freedom, possibly their lives, to say that. Alexei Navalny, who was harassed, poisoned, imprisoned, and ultimately killed, is proof of what happens to those who defy Vladimir Putin in Russia. Navalny's widow, widow, Yulia, and their two children did not attend the funeral because of fears of their own safety. Russian police patrolled the funeral. They stopped mourners from entering the church, unable to view, as you just saw, the open casket where Navalny's body was covered with red and white roses. The New York Times reports data showed that cell phone service in the area had been reduced to the lower bandwidth 3G standard and described it as a mobile shutdown. That's what it means to live in Russia with Putin. Despite this, a quarter of a million people streamed Navalny's funeral, and that is Putin's worst nightmare. Vladimir Putin is running for re-election right now. The election is in two weeks. Even in death, Alexei Navalny, who dared run against Putin in the last presidential election in 2018, was able to speak through his supporters today, defiantly objecting to Putin's rule. And today, Vladimir Putin, who is essentially running unopposed this year, made a martyr out of his enemy. Today, Alexei Navalny's protest against him was louder, and it was multiplied in the voices that shouted, we won't forget, and Russia will be free at his funeral today. Back here, it's a reminder to not take our own democracy for granted, especially in an election year when the presumptive Republican nominee Donald Trump is a Putin fanboy. Trump loves Putin's impunity, which he perver perversely calls strength. He promotes a similar authoritarian vision here in America, undermining law and order and dehumanizing people, threatening judges and prosecutors. Just last night on Fox, Trump said presidents in America need full immunity in order to take, quote, severe actions. You're trying to do something good for the country, even if it's severe. The severe may be a great thing for the country. They have to have presidential immunity. Severe. Like what? Mass deportations? Shooting protesters? Ginning up mobs of, to execute vice presidents and generals who try to stop him? That is how people live in dictatorships. In Russia, with Putin, where the general who defies him goes down in a plane crash and the candidate who uh, runs against him dies of sudden death syndrome in a remote Siberian prison. This is who Donald Trump sees as a hero, according to the former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. I mean, I've been with Trump and Putin. Uh, Trump is in awe of Putin. He's, uh, when you see Trump with Putin, as I have on a few occasions, he's like the 12-year-old boy that goes to high school and meets the captain of the football team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my hero. It is really creepy. Donald Trump wants to help Putin end NATO. Donald Trump wants to help Putin defeat democracy in Ukraine. And most Republicans in Congress who live in a free country who have so much less to fear than every ordinary person who showed up at Navalny's funeral today continue to help Donald Trump's dark vision of a world more like that of Vladimir Putin.
Leading off our discussion tonight is the retired Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. He served as Director of European Affairs at the National Security Council during the Trump administration, and MSNBC International Affairs Analyst Michael McFall, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Russia from 2012 to 2014. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me for this important uh, lead-off discussion tonight. Colonel Vindman, you are one of those people who, who you came from a part of the world that was not enjoying democracy, and you saw something, as a, as a person who worked in, in, in the administration, you saw something that felt dishonest, and you stood up. You had something to lose, and you did lose something. You lost your career um, for doing it. But that was what you, when you said, we can't have this lawlessness that goes on in the other parts of the world in America. Well, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we're seeing both uh, Trump telegraph the kind of world he wants to live in, and then we don't have to use our imagination too hard because we could see that world manifest in front of us because he, he, Trump tells us he wants to uh, emulate Vladimir Putin. And in that, we see what life could be like. We see a world in which um, Trump would like to eliminate his opposition. He'd like to imprison them, poison them, potentially murder them, mass deportation. We saw that play out in re regards to Russia. And what I fear and what I, frankly, uh, desperately hope doesn't happen is that we don't have to have our population come out in, the, in thousands or tens of thousands to protest against uh, uh, barbarism in the United States. Uh, it's, it's striking that over the course of two years of war, Putin has done everything he could to suppress that population, to oppress that population, and think he's cowed them. And clearly that's yep. not the case. People were out on the street chanting against the war, chanting for, um, for Alexei Navalny and for a different vision of Russia. And again, I do, do not wish to see anything like that happen in the United States. And that's why you hear me and you hear Ambassador McFaul, who I had the privilege of, of serving with in, in Moscow, uh, are, are so focused on making sure that war over there doesn't come home to the United States, that our troops that aren't getting, uh, don't get pulled in and that we protect democracy at home. Ambassador, let's talk about this idea that we are two weeks away from an election in which there has never been any doubt that Vladimir Putin will be the victor. Why does this stuff still happen? Why are those people prepared to go out there? They know who the next president of Russia is going to be. They know from, as Colonel uh, Vindman said, they know from the outbreak of the Ukraine war and other uh, demonstrations in favor of Navalny or supporting his efforts. They know you can go to jail for this in Russia, and yet they come. Yet they come knowing that they may face arrest or harassment or worse. Well, I have deep admiration for all the people that did come on this horrific day for all of Russia, uh, for the Navalny family, for me personally. I knew I know the Navalny family. I knew Alexei personally for many years. He was a tremendously talented leader. He was the Mandela. Uh, he was the Havel. He was the Valenza uh, of his country with one horrible, tragic difference. He was killed in prison. He was not released. And to answer your question, uh, I would say, uh, just remember what Navalny said in the movie at the end of it. If they have to kill me, and if I'm dead, that means we're stronger than, than you know we are. Then you, that we're stronger than you think we are. Uh, something to that effect. And I think what you saw today, because you're absolutely right, every single one of those people are being photographed, they can go to jail for years for what they were chanting. I have friends in jail in Russia right now who have gone to jail for years for chanting what they said, but they are defying him. And for everyone that was there, there are many, many more sitting in their kitchens that are afraid, but have exactly the same preferences. And I think we have to remember that not all Russians think like Putin, mm -hmm. not all Russians support Putin. Uh, uh, Vladimir Karamurza told me, uh, Colonel Vindman, he told me years ago, he said, when, when talking about these stories, don't say Russians. Talk about Putin. Talk about the Russian administration. Don't paint all Russians with the same brush. And the same thing can be said for America right now, for a lot of people around the world who are looking at us saying, what are you people doing? It's not all of us people. There are people in America who protest every day. There are people who protest the injustices, who, are, who fight it by running for office, who fight it by being in office. Um, so this is, this is not a fight we have lost in America yet. We have the vote. Our vote actually does matter. And we can make changes. But it takes acts of courage to do this. I think that's true. I think, frankly, we, we might have only one more vote left that really matters. If, uh, if Trump comes to office, he's already declared that he intends to be a dictator. 
Uh, the president and the chief executive is invested with in, in broad powers. And uh, it, it's not easy to undo American democracy that's been around for nearly 250 years. But a, a lot of damage has been done, and, and President Trump has every intention to do that. So we have uh, one more vote. We need to make sure our population shows up. So like this, we don't have to face those, those challenges in, in the oppression that you know the, the Russians are facing. I think the fact is that between now and then, it's going to be a particularly different, uh, difficult period. There are steps that need to be taken to make sure that the war in, between Russia and Ukraine doesn't spill over, doesn't magnify, that the highest risk of that happening, frankly, is if Ukraine doesn't get support. The Republican Party must show up in, uh, in an effort to support and advance U.S. national security and pass a Ukraine aid package, a uh, same aid package that would support Taiwan and Israel. But it's critically important that Ukraine gets aid. Otherwise, there's a very, very big risk that, it, that the war could spill over. Uh, President Macron of France alluded to something of this nature, a worst case scenario in the absence of the, of the U.S. in which Europe has no choice but to face off against Russia in Ukraine, so like this, they don't have to face off against Russia right. on their own territory. So this is an important point you bring up, because one would say President Macron, uh, ambassador, is the president of France, a NATO country. Why would Russia go into a NATO country? I want to remind our viewers of what Donald Trump said uh, on February 10th in South Carolina uh, about uh, a, a nameless uh, NATO leader who said, if, you know, if we don't pay what you say we're supposed to pay, which is a sort of a, a misrepresentation to start with, uh, will, will you protect us if, if Russia does something? And here's what former President Trump said. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. So there you have it, uh, Ambassador. As the colonel says, we don't have to really uh, stretch our minds too much to imagine what Donald Trump would do in, in these cases, because he tells us what he would do. Well, he does, and that is really scary for me for the following reasons. Um, he may say that, and he may encourage Putin to go in to one of the countries on the border there. But the idea that we will stay out of that conflict, that is naive beyond uh, imagination. It reminds me of the 1930s, when people just like Trump said, that's not our problem over there. Doesn't matter what the Italians are doing in Ethiopia or the Japanese in China or Hitler in Poland. And then it became our problem. Right. And I was just in Munich last week, speaking to leaders from that part of the world and in Vilnius the month before. They are scared to death of that scenario when Putin tests our commitment to Article 5 and we have a president perhaps like Mr. Trump. And it is naive for Americans to think that we will be able to keep out of a war in Europe. Better to be strong now, Ronald Reagan said it, peace through strength, than to wait for that scenario to play out. And don't believe me, just go back and read what happened in the 1930s, yes. punctuated uh, by what happened to us in 1941. Ali, Ali if I could come yep. in on this. I just want to, I mean, the danger is frankly more real than that. This is not a what-if scenario, what happens if Donald Trump is back in office in 2025. The threat is real, because what Donald Trump has done is he's offered a signal that the Republican Party, not just Trump in the future, but the Republican Party today would not show up in the event of an attack on NATO. And that's, a, that's a recipe for disaster. That's an invitation for Putin to test that resolve. He's been wanting to destroy NATO for the whole time to test that resolve, and that's a recipe for our troops to be in danger today, because we would defend him, but he might not perceive it that way. And that's the same kind of scenario that unfolded in the, month, the weeks and months before February 2022, where, where Putin believed he saw the signal that the Republican Party, the, the political establishment in the United States wouldn't show up, and he struck. He struck out at Ukraine. We are kind of in that same situation now. It is very dangerous, it is very real. And even in the num uh, months before this election, I think our troops are now in much greater danger than they were beforehand. That's a remarkable before perspective on that. Uh, Ambassador, you, you and Colonel Vindman are both students of history. Uh, one doesn't have to go too far back in history. You can go back to uh, September 11th, 2001, to the one and only time that Article 5, the mutual defense uh, article in, of NATO, was invoked. And it was in invoked in the defense of the United States of America by every other member nation who said, you have been attacked, so we have been attacked. We're here for you. That's right. I'm glad you reminded me, uh, everyone, of that. I don't think Mr. Trump understands that. And by the way, they didn't just invoke Article 5. They send their soldiers to fight with us 
and to die with us in Afghanistan. So when I hear all this debate about 1%, 2.1%, I want to remind everybody that our NATO allies died for us. Uh -huh. We have not had to fight for them, and we're all better off. The one great advantage we have as the United States of America when dealing with Russia or dealing with China are our allies. Uh -huh. It's our one superpower. We have allies and they don't. So why Donald Trump doesn't understand that basic fact about our national security? I know the Republicans do around him. I know they're just afraid of him. Uh, I wish they would speak up. Um, and, it, and to go back to your analogies between Trump and Putin, I actually wrote a piece about that, Ali, in February of 2017. And it wasn't uh, how in Russia, the civil society activists were there, the opposition parties were there. You know who was quiet? It was the people in his party, the oligarchs, mm -hmm. uh, and those that allegedly listened to his Christian values, right? Well, he's not so bad. He's going to cut our taxes, and he speaks about Christian things that we care about. That's what they said in the early years of Putin, and it's eerily yep. uh, similar to what I hear now. So it's those people being silent that need to speak up before it's too late. Gentlemen, we appreciate your, your time, your expertise, your commitment to democracy. Alexander Vindman and Michael McFall, thank you. All right, coming up, we'll bring you the latest defendant Trump developments today as Donald Trump and Jack Smith were in the same courtroom. Andrew Weissman and Katie Fang join us next. It was a big day in court today for two of the four criminal cases against Donald Trump. Both could have major consequences for how these two cases play out and when. It's now up to Judge Scott McAfee to decide whether to disqualify the Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis from prosecuting Donald Trump's Georgia inter uh, election interference case. During closing arguments today, defense lawyers for Donald Trump and other co-defendants alleged that she financially benefited from a romantic relationship with the lead prosecutor, Nathan Wade, creating a conflict of interest that should disqualify her. But the state pushed back, arguing that the defense had not met their burden of proof to disqualify Fonnie Willis and discrediting the defense's star witness, who this week admitted that he was speculating about the details of their relationship. The judge said he will make a decision within two weeks. As The New York Times notes, the stakes are high. If Ms. Willis is disqualified from the case, her entire office would be, too. And the case would probably be turned over to a district attorney from another jurisdiction. The new prosecutor could choose to continue the case as planned, modify the charges, or drop them. Meanwhile, in Fort Pierce, Florida today, special counsel Jack Smith and Donald Trump faced off in the same courtroom in front of a Trump-appointed judge, Aileen Cannon, to determine when the trial of Donald Trump's mishandling of classified documents will begin. Jack Smith's team argued that the trial should begin on July 8th. But in front of Judge Cannon today, Donald Trump's lawyers again pushed for the trial to be postponed until after the election, calling it unfair to take Donald Trump off the campaign trail and claiming that a July trial would be unworkable given Donald Trump's hush money trial in Manhattan that will begin later this month. Trump's lawyers told Judge Cannon that if the trial had to be before the election, the earliest they could do is August 12th. Politico reports that in some of the most pointed language of the hearing, Jay Bratt, a prosecutor on Jack Smith's team, criticized Trump's delay tactics, saying, quote, what it really seems to me is that those dates, those were fake dates and really almost bad faith dates. We just need to bring this case to trial this summer. Judge Cannon also raised the issue of the Justice Department's 60-day rule, an internal guideline that prosecutors should not take any legal action within 60 days of an election to avoid impacting the result. According to Politico, quote, that provision does not apply in a case that has already been charged, Bratt responded, adding that the special counsel's team had consulted with the Justice Department unit that handles most cases involving politicians and candidates, the public integrity section. Quote, it does not apply to setting a trial date, end quote. Judge Cannon did not indicate how or when she would rule. Joining us now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division of the Eastern District of New York. He's an MSNBC legal analyst and the co-host of the important MSNBC podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump. He's also co-author of the new book, The Trump Indictments, the historic charging documents 
with commentary, end quote. And joining us from Atlanta, Georgia, is Katie Fang, an attorney and the host of The Katie Fang Show on MSNBC. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how you're awake, Katie. Uh, both of you have been working remarkable hours. Katie, let me start with you and, and Georgia and the stakes in this case and what you heard today and what it makes you think. So it was closing arguments, Ali, and it was three hours of closing arguments, which was remarkable, but not really if you consider the fact that there are so many defendants. And I guess the footnote to that would be the import of this case. I mean, it started with 19 co-defendants. It's a RICO case with multiple other offenses. You've already had four of those co-defendants played out, some of whom were critical to the scheme to defraud and to try to overturn the Georgia election results. And the reason why I talk about that is because we cannot lose sight of the fact that that is what this prosecution is about. We have taken somewhat of a circus sideshow detour over the span yes. of a number of weeks now to be able to litigate a motion to disqualify, which in any any jurisdiction would be serious, but in this particular jurisdiction, it has such import, as you discussed in the setup, Ali, because if Bonnie Willis is disqualified under Georgia law and procedure, her entire office is disqualified, and then you have to wait an innumerable amount of time for a reassignment, and then the ultimate prosecutorial discretion of that new DA as to whether or not they want to pursue all of the charges, some or none. But after these three hours of closing arguments, what we were left with, those of us that have been carefully observing, was the fact that Judge McAfee had a series of questions that he peppered to the defense and not so much to the state. And what he focused on, for me, as a lawyer and somebody who tried cases um, in multiple courts, is the following. Following. You know, you have to have a burden of proof. You know, Jack Smith, for example, when he takes Donald Trump and others to trial, will have the burden of proof to prove his case beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. It's a lower burden in this evidentiary hearing scenario, but there's a burden nonetheless, but it's not on the prosecution. It's on the defense. And when you heard the judge ask the defense about whether or not, you know, they understood that something that is suggestive of wrongdoing is not a preponderance of the evidence standard, it may just stop and consider the fact that the judge is carefully weighing the evidence in this case, the testimony that's been provided by a number of witnesses, including D.A. Fonnie Willis herself and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. But it's worth mentioning quickly, Ali, that the star witness for the defense, and in fact, he was called the star witness by the judge himself because there was these huge promises that were over-delivered by the defense in terms of Terrence Bradley, the former divorce attorney for Nathan Wade. He's the only witness that took the stand twice during the course of this evidentiary hearing, and he was just a big womp womp for the defense in the end. He refused to corroborate or to affirm what the defense said, which is that he had provided all of this very salacious kind of information behind the scenes about his former client, Nathan Wade. The defense is saying that Fonnie Willis still got a personal financial benefit. But when the judge asked the defense, well, can you define that? The defense said, well, it's like obscenity. Judge, you know it when, no, you, when see you see it. it. I mean, Allie, that, that's not an evidentiary standard. Right. That's not evidence. And I think that is what is going to be the important thing for the judge. What is the evidence? Can you tune out the white noise? Can you tune out the pressure, all of the potential optics of a decision? And can you base it on the evidence? And I submit to you that I think the judge in this case is, is going to do that. And we're going to get a ruling in the next two weeks. That much he's told us, Andrew. What we don't have uh, is, is when the uh, Florida uh, judge, uh, Aileen Cannon, is going to give us a ruling. And look, one of the things she's become known for is she takes her time with stuff and, and has been somewhat sympathetic to the, uh, the, 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 the Trump uh, legal team's constant requests for more time and, and more things. Uh, but today they got shut down, at least on one front, by by the Jack Smith uh, team about this idea that you can't start a trial within a couple months of an election. Um, obviously, you know a lot about these things. Sure. Um, I think that there's no question that Judge Cannon in her rulings uh, has favored the defense. Even her reasoning has gone out of its way to find fault with the government and to side wherever possible with the defense in ways that I think continue to be pretty shocking. Remember, she is the judge who was reversed twice by the 11th Circuit before the case was indicted. Um, we do not know the trial date. She did make various comments saying that she thought that the date that was sought by the government in July was unduly 
uh, optimistic, uh, and she asked a lot of questions of the defense about not having a trial at all, and certainly not in the lead up to the election. Uh, I was surprised she even brought up the DOJ internal rule, because the internal rules of the department don't in any way give rights to the defense. They're not enforceable in any court. They're just internal guides to the Department of Justice. Um, and that's something that the judge knows very well, having worked as a prosecutor. Um, so it really was none of her business to raise that. And also, the rule simply does not apply. The rule is about not taking overt actions uh, with respect to someone who's a political a candidate shortly before an election. Why? Because you want to give that person an opportunity to have their day in court. Well, this is the reverse. This is an overt case where the government is seeking to have that trial, right. is seeking to have a day in court. So um, there was every reason for this not to apply and not for the judge to raise it in court. Yeah, I, I uh, as a as a simple non-legal guy, I struggle with this whole idea that d didn't we work really hard to make sure people can get their day in court and get it uh, in a uh, you know on a speedy basis? Uh, Donald Trump uh, turns everything on its head. Thanks to both of you, we really appreciate this. Andrew Weissman and Katie Fang, we appreciate your your incredible coverage and analysis. Coming up today, President Biden announced that the United States military will airdrop food and supplies into Gaza. We're going to discuss what that means for the people of Gaza next with the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. Nicholas Kristof. Today, President Joe Biden announced that the United States will begin airdropping food aid to the people of Gaza. We're going to join with our friends in Jordan and others in providing airdrops of, of uh, additional food and supplies. In addition to expanding deliveries by land, uh, they said we're going to we're going to insisted Israel facilitate more trucks and more routes to get more and more people the, the help they need. No excuses, because the truth is, aid flowing to Gaza is nowhere nearly enough now. It's nowhere nearly enough. Innocent lives are on the line and children's lives are on the line. And we won't stand by and let until, they, until we get more aid in there. We, we should be getting hundreds of trucks in, not just several. And uh, I won't stand by, we won't let up, and we're not going to pull out, uh, trying to pull out every stop we can to get more assistance in. The airdrop announcement comes after more than 100 people were killed on Thursday when Israeli troops opened fire as people waited for a food convoy in the north. At the start of this week, President Biden said negotiations for a ceasefire were close and could be agreed to by Monday. Tonight, President Biden provided this update on the Monday timeline. No, I was just saying, it looks like we're still, it's not there yet. President Biden? I, I, think, I think we'll get there, but it's not there yet, and I'm not, and it may not get there now. Joining us now is the New York Times columnist and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Nicholas Kristof. Uh, there, there's a lot here to unpack. And, and Nick, you wrote an op-ed on this in the New York Times. We don't even have to have an interview. You can just read the title of your op-ed. It says, Biden can do better than airdropping food to Gaza. Um, there's a lot that we can do better on. Uh, President Biden said we will st we're not stand by and we will not let up. Except we have stood by and we have let we up. We have stood by. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we have stood by, and there is some inherent contradiction in us helping provide the weaponry that creates the destruction and helping provide the diplomatic protection to Israel as it as it blocks aid, and then us moving in to, to try to drop aid on a crisis that we have helped create, and one in which many of the victims are children who uh, bear no responsibility for the terrorist attack on uh, October 7th. Let's talk about um, what we can do better. And I, I look, I will give Joe Biden credit for being possibly the most optimistic man on earth in thinking there's going to be a deal. There, there are the outlines of a deal. It's not coming together. And Benjamin Netanyahu says, as often as he is asked, that it's not the kind of thing he's going to do. So let me say what you've written about in your article. You've said the simplest path forward would be for Biden to insist that Israel open more crossing points, allow many more trucks through, permit civilian police escorts, and accept that UNRWA and aid groups will play a central role in food distribution. That would be less visual than an airdrop, but it would save far more lives. Expand on that, please. 
So one reason for the tragedy yesterday was that uh, Israel apparently did not want to have food aid delivered through uh, UNRWA, the, the UN organization that it has um, made a lot of allegations against and uh, that may well have had 12 people participate in the October 7th attacks. Uh, it has also been reluctant to work with traditional aid agencies. Um, and so it apparently had contractors uh, protected by Israeli tanks try to go in um, um, and look, you know, the people who know how to deliver aid are those aid agencies, including UNRWA. They have that that those people on the ground, that network. And what you need to make airdrops work, and I've seen them, is also that group, you know, those people on the ground who collect uh, pallets when they're dropped, who protect it from just some random gunman seizing it. You know, if you just drop food aid, who's going to get it? It's going to be Hamas, not the most vulnerable people. And right now, the most vulnerable people in Gaza are kids. Um, and, you know, the toll there, it just, you know, I mean, I've covered a lot of crises around the world, but... I, uh, you know, 250 children under the age of one have died so far in Gaza. I can't think of any recent conflict in this century in which that many kids have died that quickly in a war. So you're not, you know, you're not just a columnist. As you said, you have you have covered some of the worst things on earth. You have gone to cover the stories that most people have forgotten or never even wrote about in the first place. Uh, the, the, the metrics you use for this, you just described one about the number of kids killed. I saw one the other day. I haven't I haven't run it down, but it says that starvation is growing at a faster rate than it's ever grown at any point in history in Gaza. Just the rate at which people are going from people who would have a meal to eat or enough calories to survive to the rate at which you are more likely to die of starvation or disease or illness than than from a bomb uh, is, is increasing uh, faster than it's ever increased anywhere in the world. That that appears to be true. We don't have good metrics on the malnutrition, but it certainly seems to be expanding extremely quickly. And one of the things we've learned is that severe acute malnutrition, uh, you know, it kills kids extremely quickly. And it, it's once you let it get out of control, it's very hard to reverse. It could kill kids on a much, much greater scale than anything we've seen so far. And the kids who are most vulnerable are those from about six months to about three years of age. Um, but, you know, already, I mean, here's another metric. Um, the worldwide, in 2022, in all conflicts all around the globe, about 2,900 children died, according wow. to the United Nations. Well, now, in just five months, in Gaza alone, uh, we've had 12,500 children die. Um, you know, the UNICEF calls it the most dangerous place in the world to be a child. There are a lot of dangerous places, yeah. um, but uh, Gaza, it says, is now number one. Well, a number of important columnists like yourself have, have chimed in in the last few days to say it, it's time for a different approach with Israel. And for whatever reason, Joe Biden's been, been been slow to do that. He says he uses the words that say that they're going to apply pressure. And I'm sure behind the scenes, that's what's going on, except it's not working with Netanyahu. What does success look like on that front? What is that? Is that picking up a phone call? What, what, what happens to say the 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 unrestricted aid that the United States provides to Israel will actually stop. If that's the only thing that's going to stop your guns from killing Gazans, that's what's going to happen. So we have seen in the past uh, American administrations apply greater pressure and it, uh, you know, it's hard to do politically. Uh, it, Netanyahu is a difficult interlocutor, but it can work. And right now, uh, President Biden has, in over the last month or so, he's begun to say some sympathetic things, but we haven't seen a change in actual policy, in his ability to, in his willingness to use leverage to try to get Israel to provide more aid to uh, slow the scale of the the scale of the bombing. And you know, for example, if uh, military equipment going to Israel uh, were suddenly tied up in a little more red tape. So there was a slowdown in deliveries. I think that would be a message that would go to the IDF. And I think the IDF would in turn send that message on to Netanyahu. Um, you know, ironically, one of the few practical specific actions that President Biden has taken vis-a-vis -vis Gaza has been to suspend funding for precisely the UN agency, UNRWA, that is there to combat uh, starvation. And um, I find this incredibly 
dispiriting. President Biden has a great deal of political capital mm -hmm. in Israel because of the enormous, you know, uh, empathy he showed at the beginning, but he hasn't been willing to translate that uh, that political capital he has across the uh, Israel to either greater movement in the West Bank to protect people there, or most importantly, to try to avert starvation in Gaza. He does appear to be working toward, or at least he thinks there, there might be a deal to be had, and boy, that would be a, a, a bright light if there were a ceasefire and those hostages uh, were released. Who knows? Thank you, my friend. As always, Nick Kristof is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and a New York Times columnist. Coming up, the most important undercovered battleground of the 2024 election. With Republican dysfunction in the House, Republican obstruction in the Senate, and right-wing extremism controlling the Supreme Court, state legislatures have never been more important for protecting democracy, reproductive rights, and more. That's next. Donald Trump is dangerous yes. to women and to our families. Yes. We simply cannot let him win. We can't wake up on November 6th like we did in 2016, terrified of the future ahead of us, thinking, oh my God, what just happened? What are we going to do now? We must re-elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That was First Lady Jill Biden today speaking at the first stop on her Women for Biden campaign event in Atlanta, Georgia, with a warning for a second Trump term. Women's reproductive rights proved in 2022 and in several special elections to be an animating issue for voters across the country. And while Republicans are confronting the political fallout from conservatives on the Supreme Court striking down Roe v. Wade, Donald Trump appeared on Fox yesterday to raise the possibility of a national abortion ban if he's elected. Today, CVS and Walgreens announced that they will begin filling prescriptions of the abortion pill Mifepristone this month in states where abortion is legal. And while that's welcome news, it's just more proof of the nightmare of uneven patchwork abortion care, uh, reproductive care in post-Roe America. And it comes as the Supreme Court plans to hear arguments against the abortion pill later this month. The ramification of Republican policies in the wake of Roe's reversal extend far beyond abortion. Just two weeks ago, in vitro fertilization was effectively stalled in Alabama after that state's conservative Supreme Court ruled that embryos were children. At a campaign event in Durham, North Carolina today, Vice President Kamala Harris laid the blame squarely on one person, Donald Trump, for the erosion of women's reproductive rights. Let's remember um, that the architect of where we are now and the taking of these freedoms was the former president of the United States, who has boasted about the fact that he essentially handpicked three members of the United States court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade. And the work that we have to do at this point is about restoring these fundamental rights and freedoms for the people of our country. Joining us now is the president of the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, Heather Williams. Heather, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. You know, one of the things, if, if you open your fridge door and you get a smell and you can't figure out what's spoiled, if you, if you rummage around a little bit, you sometimes you find something you weren't looking for. And in this case, it's the states in many cases. It's state legislatures. When, when Roe fell, there was this idea that everybody will just do this for themselves. We're just giving the states the right to do it. And what we learned is the states can be draconian. Yeah, well, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. And that is absolutely right. So we at the DLCC are the party committee responsible for building power in the states and really setting the national agenda. And what we know is that when the Supreme Court decided on Dobbs, when they decided on Roe, so much of the work moved into the states. The mandate moved to the states. And we're seeing states act on this day in and day out. We're seeing Republicans roll back our rights, and we're seeing Democrats in power preserving them. We know that the states is, is moving policy that affects our lives so closely and daily, and that it is everything from abortion rights to gun safety to climate to voting rights. All of that is happening in your backyard, in your states. And, and for folks who don't 
come out. They're not motivated by their state elections. Uh, it's important to point out their number of states, for instance, at, at a, a statewide level where a, a Democrat is elected, and yet they've got a Republican majority in the state house or legislature or Senate, uh, in some cases, super majorities. From the DLCC's uh, strategy memo, I want to read this. To stop this crusade of dangerous legislation from becoming law, restoring the veto power of Democratic governors in red states is essential. The DLCC's 2024 target map includes Kansas, North Carolina, and Wisconsin to break up or even prevent Republican supermajorities and empower Democratic governors. Tell me about this. Yeah, so um, power in the states is so important. And we think about power in the, the perfect way, right, which is Democratic trifecta. Um, we think about it in terms of flipping majorities. But then there's this really important piece of protecting Democratic governors' veto power. Last year, we saw in North Carolina um, one vote decide abortion rights for the you know nearly 10 million people that live in North Carolina. They rolled it back with one vote and, mm -hmm. and moved an abortion ban. So, um, you know, protecting our Democratic governors who are working so hard um, to ensure that, uh, you know, our rights are preserved is, is really critical. A lot of this, when you say, how is it that um, you know, there's a Democratic governor in this place with a, a Republican supermajority. It's because of redistricting. Because if you vote for your governor, everybody in the state gets to vote. The re redistricting has no effect on you. When you're voting for your, your state representative, redistricting does affect you. That's exactly right. And that is why it is so important that... Um, when folks go to vote, that they're not just voting top of the ticket for their governor or for the president, that they're voting all the way down. I feel like I cannot stress enough how impactful the states are on our everyday lives and how the issues that we matter most are being decided there. And if folks are interested in learning more, um, getting involved in their local races, they should head to dlcc.org. Uh, Heather, uh, thank you for this. Uh, thank you for uh, for making some of these things clear to us because the answer still lies with people making these decisions to go to the polls and to change the outcomes. Heather William, uh, Williams is the president of the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, DLCC. We'll be right back. And that's tonight's last word. Uh, the brilliant Michael Ludig, Judge Michael Ludig, the conservative jurist, joins me tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. on Velshi. You can see my shows Saturdays and Sundays, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, right here on MSNBC.